treasure of the mighty Aztec Emperor Montezuma. When Spanish conquistadors invaded, the breathtaking hall vanished without a trace. Legend says the riches were taken far to the north, to the fabled land of Aztalan. The quest for Aztec gold began with a drifter, who believed it was buried near a small town in America. It's here. I believe that Montezuma's treasure is here someplace. He was followed by others who came in search of the treasure. They were seeing all kinds of ghostly figures. Have they awoken an army of Aztec warriors? There's people who've lost their lives. And condemned this town to live under the curse of the fearsome Montezuma. There is a curse that's keeping people from finding this treasure. The quest started almost 100 years ago. One summer's day in 1914, a dusty old prospector cycled along Johnson Canyon in Utah, in the southwest of America. His name was Freddie Crystal, and he was in a hurry to get to a town called Kanab. I am sure that the people of Kanab thought that Freddie sounded a bit mad, and he looked a bit mad. Wild-eyed and crazy hair, unshaven, not the typical person that comes into town. And Freddie Crystal certainly had a wild tale to tell. He told the people of Kanab that the treasure of Montezuma was buried near their town. If they'd help him find it, they'd all get a cut. It wasn't the sort of story these no-nonsense folk were used to hearing. The bulk of the people who lived in Kanab were members of uh, the Latter-day Saint religion, um, the Mormons, and they, they were small town folk. They lived very ordinary lives. They farmed, they ranched, they ran local stores. Kanab would have been just a little farming community, people trying to scratch a life out of the, the dirt. They didn't want much to do with anything with him or his treasure at that time. Freddie simply couldn't understand how they could turn their backs on one of the world's largest halls of riches. When the Spanish first saw the treasure, they were awestruck by the vast array of jade, turquoise, silver, and gold. But when the conquistadors ransacked the Aztec capital, they discovered that the treasure had vanished. When faced with an agonizing death, the Aztecs still refused to reveal where the treasure had been hidden. Freddie Crystal was convinced that the priceless hoard had been spirited away to southern Utah. His belief was absolute. The story of Aztec gold had come to him in a vision. Before Freddy ever even got to Kanab, he was a prospector up in Idaho. He was working in a mine and he got hit in the head with a crowbar, which caused him to have what he called a panorama, which for most intents and purposes we would call a vision. In the vision, Freddy said, he had seen a large number of Aztec warriors leading a massive procession of slaves. This large group headed north and crossed the Rio Grande into what is now Texas. They then traveled across New Mexico into Arizona and finally reached the Colorado River. The Aztecs and the long line of slaves moved into what is now southern Utah. But then suddenly, Freddy Crystal's vision started to fade. The Aztecs and the slaves completely disappeared.
Then one image slowly emerged from the haziness. It was a type of ancient rock carving known as a petroglyph. Freddy was completely baffled. Why had he seen the warriors driving a slave train thousands of miles north from the Aztec lands to what is now southern Utah? Freddy decided to find out all he could about the history of the long-lost Aztec nation. His reading led him to the events surrounding the downfall of the once mighty Aztec Empire. Although the Aztecs were renowned for ruthless cruelty and mass blood sacrifice, they initially welcomed the Spanish conquistador, Hernán Cortés. Cortés couldn't have timed his arrival better. It had been prophesized a white god would appear in 1519, and here he was, standing before them. The Spaniard wanted to see gold, and the obliging Aztecs showed their new god straight to their treasury. The conquistadors were staggered, and one of their number stated that all the riches of the world were to be found in that single room. When the inevitable hostilities broke out, the Spanish murdered Montezuma and made straight for his treasure room. But the vaults were empty. The treasure was gone. But the Spaniards hadn't traveled this far to simply give up on the biggest cache of booty they'd ever laid their eyes on. And when it came to cruelty, the conquistadors could teach the Aztecs a trick or two. They wanted that treasure and were prepared to do whatever it took to find out where it was. It was said that not a single Aztec cracked. Freddy then read later accounts, stating that the treasure had been spirited away to the north, to the fabled original homeland of the Aztecs, Aztalan, located in what is now the southwest of the USA. Legend has it that the Aztec warriors were sealed up with the treasure in a cave. Their mission, to protect their emperor's treasure from anyone who broke in to steal it. And now, at last, Freddy realized the meaning of his vision. He was convinced he'd seen the army of slaves carrying the treasure trove as far north as the Colorado River. At that point, the vision had blurred. But then one tantalizing clue was revealed, and Freddy believed this was the marker pointing to the location of Montezuma's treasure. He did have one clue, and the clue he had was a petroglyph that had been carved onto a red wall. But the southwestern states of America are full of red canyons, covered with thousands of petroglyphs. For Freddy to find one particular petroglyph somewhere out in the vast wilderness seemed an impossible task. Freddy Crystal had hit a brick wall. Months later, Freddy had pretty much given up on ever finding the treasure. Then one evening, after a hard day's prospecting, Freddy decided to catch up on the local news. His eye was drawn to one article. It was all about a Mormon elder a Mr. Levi E. Young. And he had gone down to Kanab to conduct some church business and then had, for fun, taken some pictures and done just some sightseeing of the gorgeous country down there. But it was the photograph that really made Freddie sit up. There was no doubt about it. 
It was the very same image he had seen in his panoramic vision. And Levi Young had now told him where it was. It was somewhere on a canyon wall, somewhere near a town called Kanab. Freddy jumped on his bike and headed 300 miles to the south. He was convinced he was finally honing in on the long-lost treasure. But Freddy's blind faith in his cause wasn't shared by the devout Mormons down in Kanab. Most of the people in Kanab did not give him the time of day, but one gentleman was willing to take a chance on Freddy, and his name was Oscar Robinson. He owned a ranch, and he agreed to let Freddy come stay at his ranch. Oscar Robinson took Freddy in and gave him free board and lodging. This was a cowboy ranch. Oscar Robinson had a bunch of livestock, some sheep and some cows, and so he helped subsidize and give Freddy a stake. A lot of the other ranchers didn't like Freddy. He was a, a bit of a freeloader, and his one purpose to be in Kanab was to find the gold. Freddy had landed on his feet. The Robinson Ranch was right in the heart of the canyons surrounding Kanab. It was prime petroglyph hunting territory. Every morning, Freddy would set out early from the ranch. He needed to check every single yard of the vast canyons and cliffs radiating out for miles all around Kanab. Kanab is a town that is surrounded by beautiful red cliffs. It's rugged country. It's huge. I mean, we're almost next to the Grand Canyon. Many of the canyon walls are covered with petroglyphs. Freddy had to check out every single one. And so for one person to try and pinpoint uh, the exact location was an overwhelming task. But not for Freddy. He was a man on a mission, a mission dictated by a vision. He searched the hills for about two years, all the while the ranchers at Oscar Robinson's ranch making fun of him nightly, telling him he was crazy. Freddie would also show the photograph to anyone who would still give him the time of day. And then, in 1916, he finally got some fantastic news. One man had seen the petroglyph that Freddie thought would point him to the location of the treasure. Crystal couldn't believe how he could have overlooked it. It was just two miles up the road from the Robinson Ranch. And then he found out how. Some told him that the petroglyph had been blasted off the wall. It seems a farmer had wanted to create a shelter under the rock to store hay. and he had unwittingly reduced Freddy's vital marker to Montezuma's treasure to a sad heap of sand in an instant. Freddy Crystal seemed to have taken the news badly and vanished just as suddenly as he had appeared. And the people of Kanab assumed it was the last they would ever see of the wild-eyed man and his tall tales of lost treasure. Then, in early 1922, a familiar figure was seen cycling along Johnson Canyon. They were very surprised six years later when Freddie showed up back in town. Freddie made a beeline for the Robinson Ranch. He had some great news for his old partner, Oscar. And he said he had spent the last six years in Mexico finding a map. After the sudden destruction of the petroglyph, a desperate Freddy had recalled his fevered vision. He had seen the vast procession of slaves leave what he now knew was the capital of the Aztec Empire, Tenochtitlan. In their rage at not finding the treasure, the Spanish razed the ancient Aztec city to the ground and rebuilt it as Mexico City. 
Freddy traveled to the city, and once there, heard an intriguing rumor. It was said that one Aztec had been caught by the Spanish, and he had a map. Furthermore, the map revealed the location of Montezuma's treasure. In the mayhem during the bloody Spanish conquest, the precious map had been lost. Freddy learned that the old colonial records were stored in the basement of a monastery. So in the dead of night, Freddy Crystal jumped the wall and broke in. And finally, he found exactly what he was looking for. The map described an area. It had a cliff. Below the cliff, there was supposed to be a marsh. And then it was surrounded by seven mountains. The cliffs and marshes reminded Freddy of the landscape in Johnson Canyon, but included something he had never seen on his many trips through the hills. A set of steps leading upwards. Freddy was convinced the treasure had to be hidden at the top behind the entrance. When Freddy returned, it was almost like a rewind. Once again, he started searching the hills. He would um, hike to the top of mountains with his map in hand. Freddy was looking for a spot where he could see seven mountains lined up as on the map. Once he got to the top of uh, different cliffs and mountains, he would pull out his map and he would try to match the different um, geographical landmarks. And now he had a map. Some of the younger cowboys started to show more interest in Freddy's story. Alvin Judd, Oscar Robinson's 16-year-old son-in-law, was particularly keen. In his spare time, Alvin and his pal Cowhide Adams would join Freddy on his search. Freddy told them when they found the steps, they would lead to a cave sealed up with a layer of mortar. Behind this wall would be an army of ghostly Aztec warriors standing guard over the treasure. But most of the time, Freddy was out on his own, scouring the canyons to try and find the spot where the seven mountains all lined up. And then on Thanksgiving in 1922, Freddy scanned the horizon and suddenly stopped dead in his tracks. He pulled out his map and... That was the day that he found uh, the perfect match, picture perfect. Everything was there, the, the seven mountains, the cliff, the, the marsh beneath, it all, it all fit. Foot saw Freddy couldn't believe his luck. He had finally done it. He rounded up the young cowboys, Alvin Judd and Cowhide Adams, and they raced off to what they hoped was the cliff containing the treasure cave. Crystal scanned the canyon. He was looking for a set of steps cut into the rock face. They found the cliff, they were at the bottom, and they saw that there were stone steps going up. Freddy scrambled ahead, leaving the youngsters for dust and all the excitement and all the blood pressure went up and here's going to be the gold. Freddy was looking for something out of the ordinary in the rock face, some feature that didn't quite fit in. When they got up to the mountain where the steps were, um, they were looking around trying to find an opening, which there wasn't, but there was a little indention. It was though Crystal had a sixth sense. Somehow he just knew there was something special about this spot. He actually pulled out a pocket knife right then and there. Immediately, they started digging with their pocket knives, with their hands, anything that they could open up that face with. And beneath the soft, sandy face, there was something harder. It was like mortar in between rocks. The mortar was made from limestone, a mineral not found in Johnson Canyon. 
The closest is found 20 miles from here. So obviously um, somebody had brought that here to close up that wall and it had to be the Aztecs. Freddie believed he was now just feet away from the riches that had been snatched away from Cortez and his conquistadors. Any moment he knew, Freddie knew he was gonna break through that wall and find a mass cavern of riches that the Aztecs had stored there. And then suddenly, they were through. And they figured, oh my goodness, here it is. Freddy told the youngsters to hold back while he went in to scout out the cave. He knew the cave was reputed to be guarded by a long dead army of Aztec warriors. Freddy edged nervously along the sandy cavern. And then, there was actually a booby trap and a boulder had rolled onto one of his legs and it actually pinned him there. Was this the curse of Montezuma? Freddy desperately shouted for help and Alvin Judd rushed to his aid. If he had been alone, it could have been fatally, could have died there in the caves. There was no sign of Aztec warriors, but now they were worried. There could be more dangerous booby traps lying just up ahead. The excitement withdrew. The brush with death quickly sobered the mood amongst the trio of treasure hunters. It was dangerous. It was more than they could handle. And that's when they went to town and says, we've got to get the word out. We've got to get more people up here. Freddie rushed back to Kanab. He was anxious to tell everyone he was on the verge of finding Montezuma's treasure. But he needed help, and lots of it. And once word had got out that he had found the treasure cave, the whole town loved Freddy. It wasn't Freddy the freak or Freddy the weirdo anymore. Finally convinced that Freddy may be onto something, the whole community decided to help dig out the treasure, and then they would all share out the spoils. If you go back to the design of the community and how the western part of this country worked was community-based. So it worked the same way with this adventure on finding Montezuma's treasure. Everybody worked together. Within days, Kanab effectively shut up shop. The townsfolk jumped in their buggies and rode to Johnson Canyon to dig out the treasure. For a town like Kanab, to completely shut down, it's, it's really quite remarkable. All of a sudden, a little community blossomed up down the bottom of the canyon, and they began to dig. They had jobs, just like as if they were in town. Some people were in charge of the water. They had people that were in charge of the cooking, the cleaning, the digging. In the 1920s, what they used to dig with was shovels, picks, rakes, buckets, anything that they could find. Everything had to be done by hand. They'd have a bunch of buckets and a, and a line brigade. So one would take a bucket, hand it to the next, like you're putting out a fire. Everybody had a part, and it ran like oil clockwork because everybody wanted that treasure. These are ranchers and farmers, and working is their living. And so they kind of put their lives on hold for Freddie Crystal. In the 1920s, Kanab was one of the most isolated communities in the USA. But they knew completely closing down the town could attract unwanted attention. It was like a tent city here in Johnson Canyon. And certain people were left in town to make it look like the town was still busy and that it was thriving. The people of Kanab were used to thinking independently. In 1912, they had appointed the world's first all-woman council. The all-woman town council levied a fine on anyone who spoke the word treasure out loud. They wanted to take all precautions to make sure that no outsiders would hear of the treasure and try to come and claim some of the gold for themselves. The women council, they put a lid on it, and that information didn't get out very far at the time. But despite the Petticoat Council's best efforts, pretty soon rumors began to spread. 
strange things were afoot down in Kane County. There's a story of two gentlemen from Salt Lake City who managed to hear something that was going on down in Kanab, got excited about it, rode down. When they got to Kanab, everything was closed. The businesses, no one was home. Apparently, a stable lad let the cat out of the bag and pointed the strangers towards Johnson's Canyon. When they got there, they didn't get very close to where the people were working and before someone pulled a gun on them and said, you need to leave. And they did. Untroubled by intruders, the big dig continued apace. When they got to the end of the first cave, they broke through a wall, but found yet another series of caverns stretching back into the mountain. There was no sign of gold, just tons of dirt. People were starting to doubt that there was actually even any treasure to be found. Uh, that next shovel full, because that's what kept everybody going. It's just going to be the next shovel full. But when, when is that next shovel full stop? One by one, people were beginning to lose faith in Freddy Crystal. Slowly, you know, people started to give up the search and would, you know, gradually head back to their farms and their families and their way of life again. But a hardcore of diggers carried on, driven on by thoughts of treasure. I'm sure that there was a lot of people felt, you know, just one more shovel full. And after two long years, the remaining gold diggers were finally on the verge of breaking through to the last cavern. Everybody was seeing gold in their eyes. Any moment, the next shovel full, they're going to get it. They finally broke through the cave wall, but were faced with a heartbreaking sight. Somebody told me they found an old Spaniard helmet. I think a half of a moccasin they found back in there. There wasn't much for as much time as they spent. There wasn't any gold. They certainly didn't find any gold. I can't imagine what, what their hearts might have felt. But Freddy Crystal had spent well over 10 years looking for the treasure, and he wasn't about to quit now. Freddy himself was discouraged, so he took another look at the map. And it hit him that the tunnels were probably just a temporary holding of the treasure, and that the place they really needed to look was underneath all of the material they had just removed from the cave. So Freddie said, you know what? We have got to dig here where we have been throwing all this stuff for two years. Freddie's sudden change of plan went down like a lead balloon. Uh, the townspeople were not happy with this. They had just spent, I don't know, quite a long time emptying the tunnels to then be told they needed to move the very same material once again. And they lost interest. In 1924, the empty-handed townsfolk finally abandoned the dig and turned their backs on the man who had filled their heads full of treasure. Freddie just disappeared one day, and nobody really knew what happened to Freddie. Um, some speculated that the townspeople got angry at him and someone murdered him. It was said he was murdered in fury for all the wasted time. Some thought he was killed for his map, but others believed he had incurred the wrath of Montezuma and thought he may not be the last to die searching for the treasure. But Alvin Judd kept his faith in Freddy and his tales of Aztec gold and when he had any spare time. He was up there digging, my grandfather, and with his brothers. He spent 30 years or more up there. Alvin found no trace of the legendary gold. But it wasn't to be the last the Judd family were to hear about Montezuma and missing Aztec treasure. Freddie Crystal had arrived at Oscar Robinson's ranch in 1914. Almost 70 years later, another stranger showed up, talking about Montezuma and his long-lost treasure. His name was Raymond Dillman. The Dillmans uh, showed up, and my mother was there alone this particular day. And this old green van drove up, and it was full of 
the Spanish looking people and they were big people. My mother's kind of scared because there was, you know, she's out there alone. And they didn't dare get out of the van. My mom tells this story lots better than I do. When I saw the occupants in there, it really quite frightened me for a minute, you know, and I thought, oh no, what would I do? You know, well, the dogs took care of it. And those old dogs probably would have licked you to death. Other than that, they would have done a thing to you, but they had a big bark. Oranel Judd eventually summoned up all her courage. I went over there and he asked me if there were any uh, hieroglyphics on the walls. And she says, yeah, there's some right there by the house. And he, he said, well, can I see them? He says, sure. So she walked over there and showed him. Raymond Dillman was looking for petroglyphs of three animals all in a line. Below them, three circles. And it was the, ex the exact pictures that he was looking for. But there was one final image Dillman needed to account for. Well, do you have this big bullseye? Yeah, there's one down the canyon. The bullseye petroglyph, a nine spiraled circle, confirmed Ray Dillman's theory. And he says, the Montezuma treasure is buried on your property. Mm. <laughs> I said, oh, really? Is that what turned your hair bad? white? Yes, all of a sudden. <laughs> Any other family would probably have politely asked Ray Dillman to leave, but not the Judds. It's unusual, and I, it pricked our interests because naturally it was in our family, or we'd been a part of Freddy Crystal and the whole nine yards, and then to have somebody else come out of the blue and come right to there, and then for us to be able to take him right to the picture because we knew they were there. It's been in my family a long time. And this Dillman story of coming to our doorstep and continuing the saga in the 70s, early 80s, was amazing to us. Raymond Dillman told the Judds he had spent the previous 16 years studying a curious set of tablets called the Peralta Stones. The stones were found in the 1950s, buried by a highway in Arizona. The Peralta Stones are thought by some to be a map to the legendary Dutchman's Mine in Arizona. But Ray Dillman believed the stones had led him directly to the petroglyphs on the Judd Ranch. What he claimed was the site of Montezuma's treasure. The picture of the horse's head and so forth is what was on the ranch. The rest of the tablets actually had the map the etchings of the map to how the, that's how they got there. That's how they got, got to Johnson Canyon. Dillman claimed both Aztec and Native American ancestry, and this had enabled him to decipher the symbols on the stones. And if the stone map was good enough for Ray Dillman, it was sure good enough for Bruce and Brent Judd. The brothers got themselves an excavator, and headed down the canyon, aiming straight for the bullseye. And we started digging this place out. In the 1920s, the whole town of Kanab had turned out with buckets and spades. 60 years later, it was just two men, but they had their heavyweight excavator. The amount of dirt that we moved was 30 or 40 or 50 times more than what they did. When you think that they didn't have any equipment, everything was handmade. After a few days of digging, there was a huge pile of dirt and rock at the base of the cliff. The ground under the nine spiral bullseye was now exposed, and they soon made a grisly find. Bones. Lots of bones. After bodies had been burned, we we're going, oh my gosh, he told us they were going to be here. But it wasn't just bones. They hit a ledge, and suddenly a small object tumbled down towards them and it came running down towards us. And we all backed up and thought, oh my heck, this is a skull coming after us. And uh, come to find out it was just a pot, had uh, clay on the top of it, and inside was 213 turquoise beads. It wasn't yet Montezuma's treasure, but it seemed a very good sign of the riches to come. So you can imagine how our hearts were pumping. You can imagine the gold in our eyes. 
Just above the site was a strange-looking rock that further encouraged the brothers that they were on the right track. We call it the sacrificial stone. It was big enough that a, a man six or seven foot tall could be laid out on this stone. And it had a, a drain line where it would actually drain off the face of the cliff down off this face. The find had the brothers reaching for their history books. They quickly learned all about the Aztecs' fondness for blood sacrifice. So had they found the execution site of the slaves who had carried the treasure from the Aztec capital in the early 1500s? My thought was, dang, this is a place where they sacrificed because the blood could naturally go off the ends of the cliff. We figured it was uh, that they were probably the Aztecs and uh, that they'd been they'd beaten the people. And when they excavated further under the cliff, they found a set of flat stones we take that cover stone off, and the hole was completely full of sand. We'd go in and dig out that hole, go down about eight feet, and then we thought we had a tunnel. Here's the entrance to the cave. Montezuma's is just the next shovelful. Two feet in diameter, just enough for one person to get down in there. And guess what we found? Bodies. There were stones placed over the, the openings. And the first one that we opened up was just Chuckerbock full of bones, human bones. The bones had been cannibalized, they'd been eaten. The Judd brothers had clearly uncovered a burial ground. But could the bones be the remains of Aztec slaves that had carried the treasure far from the south? The answer turned out to be no. Carbon dating revealed the skeletons were from around 2000 BC. Predating the fall of Montezuma by three and a half thousand years. These were not the bones of the Aztec slaves. It was a body blow for Brent and Bruce and they called a halt to their hunt. However, the brothers remain convinced that Montezuma's treasure exists and it is out here in the wild country surrounding Canab. It's here. It's definitely here. It's here. I believe that Montezuma's treasure is here someplace. And Bruce now claims he knows where some of the treasure is actually hidden. I can probably say that I know where part of it is, but I'm not, uh, I'll never go to it. I'll never go after it. <laughs> Bruce now believes it is far too dangerous to hunt the treasure. Yeah, there's people who've lost their lives. The one took his boy back to see it, and uh, a rattlesnake actually killed his son. And so uh, there's some, there's some wild stories back in there. They've uh, actually had some some of the old Indians come back and say it's not time, leave it alone. The fact that the treasure may be cursed was whispered around Kanab, but it didn't deter everyone in town. Brant Child was a good friend of the Judds, but he was convinced the treasure wasn't at their ranch. He thought it was hidden under this lake, just north of Kanab. He too believed the Aztecs finally halted here after fleeing the Spanish, and that this was part of their legendary homeland. Aztalan. These, these Aztecs decided they had to leave and take their treasure elsewhere. So they came back to their homeland, back to this country. And they knew they had to put it someplace where Cortez wouldn't get it. Brant Child said that when the Aztecs arrived here, the lake didn't exist. The slaves had dug a tunnel into the cliff, walled up the treasure, then flooded the valley. His son Lon explains. There was probably around four to 6,000 warriors. The theory is, is that they actually killed the, the warriors that brought the gold here. And the Aztecs believed in the afterlife. And so their assignment was to protect this area. But thousands of dead Aztec warriors were not going to deter a man like Brant Child. When he wanted to go after something, he really went after it. 
Brandt brought in dive teams to explore the underwater cave. But the divers quickly swam into trouble. We had a professional group of divers out of San Francisco that came down. Uh, they came down with $100,000 worth of equipment. What happened with them is their equipment kept breaking down. And they just had all kinds of trouble. Linda lost her air. And uh, when we got back out, Linda's air tank had been turned completely off. That nothing wrong with the tank itself. She had plenty of air in the tank, but it had just been turned off. The divers could offer no rational explanation for the constant equipment malfunctions. But they all agreed that there was something strange happening in the underwater cavern. They were seeing all kinds of ghostly figures, a lot of crazy things. He says, I'm being choked, I'm being choked. I can see ghostly figures all around me, and they're choking me. I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Get me out, get me out. Tony Thurber had been a professional diver for over 20 years. I've been diving all over the world, and, and I've never had a terrifying experience as scary as this one was. And it wasn't just the diver who had a close brush with death that day. We woke up late that night, and the room was full of propane gas. And, and propane is very deadly. And so we, we had to leave the room, and, and I have no idea why it leaked. It had never leaked before and never leaked after. Although strange, inexplicable things were happening in the cave, there was no shortage of fresh divers ready to take up the challenge. There was many different divers um, that came down and had pretty much the same experience almost every time. Every single dive ended in failure. Brandt Child now decided on a radical solution. The easiest way would have been to access the uh, treasure would have been just to drain the lake. And, and what Dad wanted to do to drain it, actually, is just dig a big trench and drain it out into a field. But there was a problem. The federal government got wind of that, and they went to Dad and they threatened him. They said, you don't touch that lake. The US Fish and Wildlife Department informed Brand his lake was home to a critically endangered subspecies the Kanab Amber Snail. Killing just one snail would leave Brandt picking up a bill for $50,000. Lon believes it's no coincidence that the rare snails live in the lake. He believes they were put there to guard the treasure. The Aztecs used a golden snail in their religious rituals. So the, the theory is, is that the Aztecs brought their golden snail from Mexico and planted it where they planted the gold. The amber snail is a means of protecting access to the treasure. With the amber snails successfully blocking the lake route, Brandt now hatched a new plan. He brought in a crew to drill down into the cave. But then one of the crew had an unusual experience. He said, it's the strangest thing because I looked over on this knoll and there was an Indian standing there in full Indian garb, and he was holding a spear. And I said, oh, come on. <laughs> and he said, well, I started going about my biz business again, and then I looked back to see if he was still there, and he was gone. If this was a warning, the drillers chose to ignore it. And it wasn't long before they broke through to a cavern. And when they brought the drill bit up, they were staggered. When they pulled the drill bit out, it was like of gold on the, on the drill bit tip. It was an amazing development, and they needed to see just what was down in the cave. They decided that they'd put a little camera down there, and the story is, is that when they got the camera in the cavern, they could see a statue and a pile of something. He said he could see something in the middle of the of the uh, of the room that was piled up in the middle of the room, and then he could say he said he seen an image over to the side of the door where where he figured the door was at that there was something somebody standing there. Some say it wasn't a statue; it was a figure of a man, um, and then this pile that they couldn't make out because they didn't have enough lighting. Yeah, they were very excited. 
But the excitement of the find was to be overshadowed by tragedy. And, and that well driller went home that night, and he had a heart attack and died. And, um, and then what I understand is a few weeks later, his wife died too. His own brother won't come to this very day and get the drilling rig that's still parked right up there up on top. And then, Brandt got a visit from a mysterious Native American. Dad said, well, that was the strangest thing. This Indian just came out, and he told me that the treasure was here, but it's, it is to be used for the Indians, to unite the Indian tribes, and that bad things would happen to you if you continue to go after it, so you need to quit trying to go after it. And this wasn't the end of the strange incident. They both started walking back, following his tracks in the sand, and after a while, his, his tracks just disappeared. My dad got to the point where he truly believed that it was probably just protected and it wasn't meant to come out, and so he, he gave up trying. We can't disturb it. It's designed, it's, it's hit up, and it's protected by these warriors that were left here. Brandt finally decided to give up his pursuit of Montezuma's treasure. In September 2002, he died in a traffic accident. Some consider the circumstances surrounding his death as somewhat mysterious. Brandt Childs was killed um, in Marysville Canyon when he hit a horse in the canyon. A lot of people think it could have been because he disturbed the treasure. Some people believe it's cursed. It's been cursed with a curse to protect it. Some now believe that the treasure belongs to the descendants of the Aztecs, the Native American people. The legend says that there's a chosen one and that he will be able to come and access the treasure and that it will be used for the Indians. Like I say, when the time's right, then it'll come out. Lon Child has brought a halt to any attempts to get hold of the treasure at the lake. We're gonna let the Aztecs sleep, yeah. They can have their treasure. Today, many in Kanab are convinced that the 6,000 Aztec warriors continue their silent vigil. They believe the warriors await anyone reckless enough to disturb the treasure of their long-dead emperor, the mighty Montezuma.